Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Beth Doyle. I'm the manager of health and wellness at Always Health Partners. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, past several years have been incredibly challenging for so many reasons. Many folks have been looking for ways to improve their mental and emotional health, cope better, assist their children and families. And I'm really excited to introduce today's subject and presenter. Today we'll hear from Dr. Roberto Olivardia. He's a clinical psychologist and clinical instructor of psychology at Harvard Medical School. He also maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts. And in his private practice, he specializes in the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, executive functioning areas, um, issues that face students with different learning abilities. Um, he also specializes in the treatment of body dysmorphic disorder, OCD, and treatment of eating disorders in boys and men. Dr. Olivardi has a strong passion for music and he brings it into his practice. And today he'll help us understand how music can be a tool to help reduce stress, improve mood, and manage other conditions. So let me turn this over to Dr. Olivardia. Great, well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited uh, to be talking about something uh, that is very much a passion of mine. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So just to give you a little bit about my background and my interest in music. So this is uh, someone most of you probably don't know. This is a very famous Brazilian singer. Um, my mom was Brazilian and I am named after this singer, Roberto Carlos. So uh, when I say that I am a lover of music, it started even before I was born being named after a, a very famous singer. I would probably liken him to be almost like the Lionel Richie of Brazil. Uh, but interestingly, this man still performs. I think he's 80, 81 years old, and he's still doing concerts around the world. Next slide. So it started from there. And when I was nine years old, you know, I'm the youngest of three children growing up with two older siblings and hearing their music and being exposed to their music. My dad was a huge lover of music and uh, particularly Latin music. But for me, it really changed when I was nine years old and I heard a song called We Got the Beat when I was in the fifth grade, fourth grade. And I'm a big fan of the sound of drums. I thought, oh my gosh, that's such an amazing song. And begged my mother if I could buy um, whoever was singing that song, went to the record store. I grew up in Somerville. Um, and it was Music Land was a store at what was then the Assembly Square Mall. And I got this album, Beauty and the Beat by the Go-Go's. And this record just completely opened me up to this sort of punk pop uh, sound. I've read the lyrics of, of the songs and thought, oh my gosh, this is like, this was mine. Like this was something different than my brother's music or my sister's music or my dad's music. This was, this was like my music and connecting to that. Next slide, please. So from the Go-Go's, it went all over the place. So when I say I'm a lover of music, I own about 3,000 CDs. I've been to hundreds of concerts. These are just some of the artists that I've seen live and a big fan of. Uh, the Cure, who I'm a huge, huge fan of. Sinead O'Connor, Tina Turner. I just saw one of the Irish tenors, Ronan Tynan, just a couple of weeks ago. I was by far the youngest person in the audience, and that's fine. Uh, Rancid, which is a punk band, uh, Tito Puente I saw right before he passed uh, with, uh, I saw him with my dad, who was a big fan, Linda Ronstadt, Queen of Pop, Madonna, Def Leppard, that last band are the Brassaholics, which is a um, amazing group in New Orleans when I was at New, in New Orleans for a conference and was very lucky to see them. Highly recommend YouTubing them. Their music is amazing. Next slide. And more artists, uh, the Dixie Chicks. I even like country. A lot of people say, I like all music except country. I like country too. Uh, the B-52s, Boston's own Donna Summer, huge lover of Fleetwood Mac. Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys is one of my musical idols. Uh, Susie and the Banshees, the Foo Fighters, um, who I actually flew to Cleveland last year to see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony where both the Go-Go's and the Foo Fighters were being inducted. Uh, so when that's how much of a fan. Uh, punk band L7 and Sting. Next slide. So those are just some of the bands. But Dick Clark, who a lot of you will probably know is the host of uh, American Bandstand as well as a TV mogul in so many ways. But he had this quote, music is the soundtrack of your life. And that really can't be true enough. When we think about music, it's hard to just 
think about it without feeling it on some level. And all of us and all of you who are listening to this right, right now can probably associate a certain event, a certain person, a certain time of your life, your high school years, and some musical songs will probably just kind of pop up in your head. Next slide. So I'm interested as a psychologist and as someone who's just so interested in the brain too, of I enjoy music, but I love learning about what, what it is about music and what it actually does to us. Because I know how it makes me feel, but I find it fascinating when I actually read research that looks at what it's actually doing in the brain. Uh, there was a wonderful study uh, called The Neurochemistry of Music by Levitin and colleagues and looked at all of these different processes that happen in the brain when we listen to music. Music is an anxiety reducer. It actually is associated with lowering cortisol, which is a stress hormone that when we're stressed, our cortisol levels rise. Listening to music can actually have this direct impact on lowering cortisol. It could be a mood enhancer. It can actually boost immunity. Listening to music is associated with immunoglobin A, which is an antibody that's linked to immunity, as well as higher counts of cells that fights germs and bacteria. So really, really interesting. Now that makes sense also when you think about anything that could be a mood enhancer and an anxiety reducer is also going to be good for one's uh, immune system. It can be related to dopamine release. Dopamine is a neurochemical in our brain that's implicated in reward. It's implicated in motivation. When we eat a great meal, our dopamine levels rise. When we are in love, our dopamine levels rise. Well, music is associated with a dopamine release. Um, so it's a very positive, rewarding feeling, neuro literally neurochemically. It's associated with an improvement in auditory processing and working memory. And working memory is the part of memory when we go from one room to the next to get something. It's our working memory that holds on to, oh, I'm here to get a pen, uh, which is different than our long-term memory, what happened 10 years ago, or, or our short-term memory. It's implicated in actually improving prediction. And what I mean by that is that when we listen to music, there's often certain compositions or rhythms that we're listening to where we can predict you know, a lot of, let's say if a song is structured by verse, chorus, verse, instrumental, verse, chorus, that we can kind of have that sort of predictive value when we listen to a song or certain sounds that we know we'll sort of, you know, come back to. Maybe we can predict how the song will end. But studies show actually that that, that skill of being able to do that with music actually can generalize to other things. Uh, predicting when we're reading sort of perhaps what the cadence of a story will be like, um, maybe even predicting interpersonal situations, if there's like a certain flow or structure in certain social scenarios. So music is something that is enjoyable, but can generalize to these other things that are very health affirming. It also engenders a sense of community. Music, listening to music actually stimulates the production of oxytocin, which is known as the bonding chemical. Um, actually, a lot of women, when they have babies, um, produce a high level of oxytocin as a, as a bonding uh, mechanism. It releases endorphins, which is, again, that pleasurable sort of rewarding feeling in the brain. But particularly with oxytocin, it can engender a sense of community, which makes a lot of sense if we understand historically the power of music, let's say, in, in certain minority communities with gospel music and churches. Uh, or tribes and certain chants that they have, um, that there is a sense of coming together, this, this song that people will bond over. Um, certainly, I can tell you when I go to concerts, I absolutely, I feel when I, every time I go to a show, of which right now I think I have nine concerts lined up for the summer so far, um, I feel like I am, it feels very spiritual to me. It feels like I don't know any of these people that are around me. And sometimes it could be a small, tiny club of a punk show. Sometimes it could be 20,000 people, uh, like when I see Fleetwood Mac. But I know that we all have one thing in common is that we like this artist that we're about to see. And chances are we have a lot of other things in common with that. And that's powerful. To me, that's very profound. Um, other studies, there was a study that looked at musical training 
uh, for the development of auditory skills. And it was published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience and found that 15 months of intense music training improved auditory and motor skills, particularly in young people and in children. And in this study found that children who were musically trained tended to have a better vocabulary in their native language and greater reading ability. Now, interestingly, with that last note, um, I have, I work with individuals with ADHD, with learning disabilities. Um, I have two teenagers, both have ADHD and dyslexia. And when my son was diagnosed with dyslexia when he was six, and I read everything I could on it. And I remember one of the uh, things that I read that said for people with dyslexia, learning a musical instrument could be really helpful in just kind of connecting, making neuronal connections in the brain that are associated with higher phonemic awareness. And I thought, okay. And he, I had, he started playing piano, which he took to like that. Um, interestingly, some of the things that might make reading difficult um, because we associate a sound with a certain letter might actually make reading music sometimes easier for people with uh, learning differences. Next slide. So what happens to our body? It's not just all that neurochemistry, that wonderful neurochemistry that happens in our brain, but there is a huge impact in music that we have in different developmental stages. I mean, from birth, you know, we think about a baby in the womb is listening to you know, his or her mother's heartbeat. That is a certain rhythm. There's a certain song to that. Uh, for those of you who have children and might have had those sound machines, one of those buttons likely was heartbeat or womb. Um, so there's something very primitive about even music at a very, very early age. When we're young, we're sung lullabies. And in school, there are certain songs that we might sing with our teachers. Um, and then in our adolescence, music can often, as in my case, really be so intertwined with identity um, in adulthood. I mean, we have songs playing when we get married. We have songs playing when we're grieving people that, you know, through, through different stages. But also when we think about what music can do to us on other levels, when we dance, and we could dance without music, um, usually we could always have music in our head, but certainly when we're listening to music and we're dancing, dancing is you know, more than just this great physical activity that's wonderful and really good for your health, but there's a certain power of dance too, that when we are dancing, we are kind of letting go, we're carefree. Uh, to me, there's almost an assertiveness and a confidence around dancing. Because let's face it, most of us are not Alvin Ailey style dancers, uh, and we don't have to be. It's really about how we feel when we're dancing and this sort of just letting things go. And I often recommend to people, you know, because it's interesting when I ask people, when's the last time you danced that wasn't at a wedding or some event? And most people are like, I, I don't know. And I sometimes will assign that uh, to patients to say, even if you're, you're dancing by yourself in your room, and sometimes people have a hard time with that because there's so much tension that their body might be holding, they realize, wow, there's actually a lot more tension than I'm aware of. When we sing, um, it feels good to sing. We don't have to be the greatest singers, but I urge people out there to, to sing because not only is it, again, this kind of carefree, um, nature, but you're also connecting with feeling, you're connecting with your body uh, when you sing, you're connecting to a certain emotion. And actually one of um, the techniques for people who have obsessive compulsive disorder or who might struggle with certain anxiety disorders when they have intrusive thoughts or things that make them anxious, one of the techniques actually could be to sing your obsession or to sing the thing you're anxious about, because I guarantee you, your brain makes it much harder to see something as threatening when you're singing it. So if I'm, you know, worried, uh, I don't know, about an earthquake and I'm like, I'm worried about an earthquake today. Suddenly, I mean, right now, even as I'm saying that, I'm smiling because I'm being singing in this upbeat tone. And not that it's dismissing whatever it is that I'm getting, I might be getting anxious about, but it helps sort of put it in perspective and ground us so that we don't get to sort of a really high revved up panic level. Playing instruments is a wonderful way of self-expression um, and a catharsis. And, and mind you, you know, I, I grew up in a middle-class family in, in Somerville, Mass, and um, you know, couldn't afford a drum set, but I could afford a $5 pair of drumsticks that was at a, a music store. And 
Um, my poor brother's high school and college textbooks were my drum kit. And I used to put his textbook and I used to put on my headphones and listen to the music I was listening to and drum. And it felt like in my head, like I was behind a drum kit at Madison Square Garden. It was such a great feeling. Uh, songwriting can be a wonderful way to get out feeling and to get out emotion. Next slide. So there are a lot of themes also in, expressed in music. We listen to music because we're resonating with some aspect to it. Uh, music, a lot of music could be about relationships and love um, and not always great relationships. It could be about really twisted ones. It could be about abusive relationships. It could be about very conflicted ones because not all of us are in perfect relationships. Um, it could be a lot about adversity and pain. People are drawn to music because it's connecting with them on that level. We listen to music for political um, and to get to a sort of political landscape. If we think about the music around the Vietnam era was, uh, I mean, such a significant part of that history of all of that music that were protest songs and ways of getting messages out in terms of how people were, were feeling about things. Um, music can also, you know, it doesn't have to be that deep in the perspective of, of deep meaning. Sometimes it could be that great escape from just daily life and just having a good time and having a party. And I don't, I, I, I am not someone who um, would say, oh, this music is more important than that music because it's deeper. I, I don't ascribe to that. I ascribe to the idea that every music, you know, provided that it's not meant to offend and denigrate somebody um, is, is good music. I love Britney Spears music. I find it to be really great to work out to. I love the beats and the hooks in her songs. Um, I don't listen to her songs for the songwriting, but that's okay. That's not to put her music down at all. I think there's a value to have music to just escape from. Um, music could have themes of violence and anger that could resonate with how people are feeling um, themselves and could be a healthy outlet for that. Other psychological issues of depression, anxiety, artists who have their own lived experience with mental health issues that talk about it in their music. Uh, I think of Demi Lovato, for example, is a, one of those celebrities today that um, uses her music as a platform to talk about her struggle with bipolar disorder and eating disorders. Uh, feelings of disillusionment, of alienation, of rebellion against authority, but really it could be about everything and anything else because music is a reflection of just life and life has a whole multitude of themes to it. Next slide. So why do we listen to music? Sometimes we're listening to it because we want to, we want to feel happy. We want to feel content. We're looking to feel pleasant. We're gravitating to music to gain that state. Now, sometimes for different people in different situations, if we're feeling sad, we might seek happy music to get us to a more content place. When we're angry, we might seek calm music to sort of bring us to that content space. But it also, music can be to move us to a validated state, which is a little bit different than I want to feel, I want to hear this music to make me feel happy. It could be, I'm seeking something that will be congruent to how I'm feeling, which ultimately does lead to a better state of contentment and grounding. But it really is, if I'm feeling down and depressed, I listening to Cool in the Gang celebration is not going to cut it. In fact, that might actually make me feel angry because it's so not, uh, it's very dissonant from how I'm feeling. I might seek the cure. I might seek, I mean, this is the music I was listening to. It wasn't an accident that I found the cure and Susie and the Banshees in my early adolescence. Um, if I'm angry, sometimes we don't wanna listen to soft music. We wanna listen to loud rebellious kind of music because it's, it's resonating with us. But music can move us to any emotional state. Sometimes we just wanna feel stimulated, feel alive, uh, not feel bored. Sometimes music is a great way to keep our minds occupied and distracted. Next slide. Music also is a way to just connect us to ourselves. A lot of individuals in, in my practice, I'll have and get a sense of how they use music because sometimes it's very difficult to articulate what you're feeling and what you're thinking. It's easier when you can hear it and feel it on the sensory 
path that's like, oh, that person is describing exactly what I'm feeling. It's also a way of connecting to other people's experiences to understand. Uh, you know, I, I had a, a patient many years ago who um, was heterosexual and couldn't really relate to someone close in their life who had just come out and what that experience was and had heard some songs that had related to that from artists who are LGBTQ and thought, oh my gosh, like it somehow hit me in a harder way hearing that through the songs than just even hearing someone talk to me about it. That was very powerful. It connects us to culture of various cultures, cultures that we might not ever be connected with in our little bubble that we all, you know, may be in um, internationally, um, even within, you know, our country. Music could be ways of inspiring us to help us get through something. Um, many people credit and think about certain songs that might have like got them, you know, through very, very tough times. Music is also a permission to express oneself authentically and assertively. I think of music is a very assertive I mean, all art truly is assertive. You know, when someone is putting themselves out there, they're putting their emotion out there, they're putting their words out there. And that alone is a model, a modeling to people to say, hey, let's be unapologetic of how we feel and just, you know, express our truth. It could be a way of processing experiences. Sometimes music is a great way to focus or to study. I'm some, I have ADHD and for me, um, silence when I was writing a paper was deafening. It was, I could easily get distracted if I had nothing going on writing papers. And I learned at a very young age that if I had music playing in the background and it doesn't always have to be soft classical music. Um, when I was writing my dissertation, I wrote it to Green Day and Hole and Nirvana. Um, and that's what helped me get through. So different brains you know, do different things. Next slide. Um, it can support us when we exercise. Music can be a great way to motivate us. It can support a message that we promote. Sometimes it's fun to also live vicariously through artists, you know, sort of be a voyeur of a, of a lifestyle that we might not normally be associated with. It could be a great way to question certain values. And sometimes music is very, um, people could be interested in it for the technical production. I remember it even as a kid, I would listen, you know, to the, awesome headphones my dad bought from uh, Leechmere, which was an electronic store in Cambridge uh, at the time. And I would listen to a song and isolate the bass line in my head and just listen to the bass, almost like it was in 3D. And then I would put the needle on the song again and listen to the same song and just listen at the drums. And, and I would just be cognizant of like, oh, that's an interesting bass line, that sound. Oh, I wonder why they did that. And I was like almost breaking that music down, which I didn't even realize at the time, but especially to a kid with ADHD is great attentional training too. Um, but it was something that was highly stimulating for me to almost like be able to do that. Um, I really credit for helping me, you know, in, in later years in terms of some of those attentional issues. Next slide. So this is a documentary. Um, another reason people might listen to music, it's a documentary called The Live Inside. I highly recommend it. Um, a man who traveled the country and goes to nursing homes and created playlists for um, these patients who had Alzheimer's disease and dementia and created playlists for the music they were listening to in their early 20s around. And I, I won't say more than that, except to say it's very powerful and uh, you'll probably not have a dry eye by the end of the documentary. But I, I was so emotional watching this movie, not only because of just the human stories, but it speaks again to the power that music has in, in our brain and our experience. Next slide. So this is sort of a task for all of you is to be more mindful of music. How do you feel when you listen to music? What lyrics do you relate to or want to relate to? What is your takeaway when you listen to music? And not, again, this isn't to say it always has to be so deep. Sometimes it could be like, you know what? I just listened to it because it just lightens my day. Um, it's, it's just distracting. That's fine. How can you use music in positive ways? Does it reflect how you feel? Does it dictate how you feel? Does it reflect a value system? Um, how do you distinguish between an artist's experience and your own? Because sometimes, you know, we, I, I remember 
a parent being very concerned about uh, their son listening to very hardcore rap music. And she did, the mom did not understand how um, her child was relating to this music because for a number of different variables, there were a lot of differences between the artist demographic and her son. And I said, let's ask him, you know, what, what it's about. And he said, this was a young boy, um, he's like 11, who had a lot of social anxiety. And he said that what drew him to, this was Public Enemy, he was listening to NWA. He said, it wasn't even, he goes, I'm never gonna do drugs. Like, it's not that I'm listening to this mom and thinking I'm gonna do drugs. He goes, I just like the fact that they're just putting themselves out there and there's something tough about it. And I don't feel that way. I feel like I need to, it's kind of, I need that more because I worry too much about what I'm going to say to a point that it's holding me back. And he really was attracted to rap music because it was just a beat and, a, and words and the words were very powerful. So sometimes it also helps to know the artist's story. I'm a lover of music, if you haven't noticed, um, but I also, even before the internet, I was that kid going at you know, a bookstore and reading about these artists, where they came from and what their story is, which I always found gave a, a great dimension to the music. Next slide. So diversify. Um, I, you know, I always tell people, I think everyone should have their own theme song, honestly. Like when you walk into a room, have a song in your head when you wake up in the morning, um, I think it could be a very, very motivating, very empowering thing. For parents out there, I, I, I really encourage you to be more curious about um, your kids' music than critical. I know in my experience, I was so identified, I so identified myself with the music I listened to that if you criticize the music I listened to, you were criticizing me. That's, that's how I felt about it. Um, and I listened to a lot of different music, I mean, and some of which horrified, um, <laughs> horrified my parents. And I'm so grateful um, for them. They're, you know, both with, with me in spirit um, that my dad would ask me about it. He would say, you know, what, what is it about, you know, that music that you find appealing and, um, but not in a way that I felt denigrated it, that, and I would tell him, um, because if he, if it was like, oh, that stuff is trash, I, you know, I, I would have been, you know, really upset about it. Now, at the same time, there was also certainly a period of my life where saying it was trash was the point. I mean, that part of being a, a teenager is sometimes being rebellious and have it be um, uncool, you know, for your parents to like your music. Um, dance, you know, like no one is watching or dance, like you don't care that they're watching. Um, see what happens. How does your body feel when you dance, even for five minutes in your kitchen, in your living room? Um, sing, see how that connects you to feeling physical, how you feel physically and emotionally. Um, ask five people that you know, different kinds of people, different ages, genders, ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, who grew up in different parts of the world. Ask them what their top five albums or artists are and go on Spotify or YouTube and, and listen to it. I mean, you'll, you'll find some really interesting things. Have a conversation with people about the music they listen to, why they like it and share the music you like. Um, explore music events and not just concerts because obviously, you know, concerts, require money to buy tickets, but there are a lot of free music events that can occur. Um, I used to love to go to international festivals. Um, I have a very close friend of mine who's Greek and years ago uh, we would go to the Greek festival and, and there would always be Greek musicians there and I would love that you know music. And um, so there's music to be found in lots of different places that uh, don't always have to cost a, a lot of money. Next slide. So these are two great books I highly recommend if you want to learn more about the science of what music does to the brain, the power of music, and this is your brain on music. Next slide. And just a question for all of you out there is what is your favorite music for stress relief? What do you listen to when you just need to kind of discharge and let the day sort of go? Next slide. And we have about, that's my information if you want to send me an email, uh, let me know either what you thought of the webinar or if there uh, are other questions you have, I'm 
more than happy to receive any questions that people have. And I know we have about five minutes for Q&A. Great, thank you, Dr. Olivardia. This was great. And we do wanna give folks a chance to ask questions. So please put them into the Q&A or question box and happy to answer those. We do have one question already that's been waiting for you. And um, this participant is asking, can you speak to the difference between listening and playing music? What effects does it have um, on playing an instrument um, or including singing? What sort of effects do those have on people versus the listening aspect? It's a great question. So with, with the brain, um, a, it, a lot of times when people are playing, and I work with individuals who are musicians who say that when they're, in, when they're playing and writing, it's a very different process than when they're listening to it. It's much more cerebral. It's more intellectual. Um, so it may not have sort of the same effects of what it happens necessarily when, when we're listening to music. Um, there isn't a lot of research that I'm aware of of um, what happens to our brains when people are playing instruments as much as listening to them. And I wonder just even logistically, I guess you'd have to have hooking people up while they're playing the drums or guitar. But I know um, what people report is that it's very technical to them. Um, there's a real focus to it. I mean, they, they feel very grounded in the experience. Um, and th there's just a lot more sort of thinking around it and intellectualization. So sometimes musicians will say, yeah, they can't, like when they're playing music, they're not, um, they're not thinking of it in the, and experiencing it the same way as that when they're kind of more, more passively, uh, although I always feel it's active, but compared to when they're playing it um, can be, but they typically will say they feel focused, they feel connected, they feel grounded, they feel very in the moment. Um, music is very sensory driven activity. Um, and it's very sort of goal oriented in terms of a lot of times they'll often have a vision of what what they want it to be and they're kind of trying to shape it. So it's it's very cerebral in that way. Great. Um, and another one, uh, how do you feel about listening to music to help with sleep? Is that a good use of music or, or not? hundred percent. So as someone who has a lifetime history of sleep issues and um, sleep problems, um, music can be an absolute aid for that. Um, now, and again, it really can vary depending on the person. So sometimes it's, you know, it could be kind of like ocean waves and that sort of sound. Um, sometimes when I have a hard time sleeping, I will put on um, Enya, who I'm a huge fan of Enya, but I'll put it on one song on repeat so that there's no novelty, you know, to kind of keep my brain awake at a low enough volume that I can hear it, but not too loud that it's over stimulating. Um, having said that, though, I know people that um, go to sleep with Metallica um, <laughs> playing and which sounds what? How are you going to do that? At the end of the day, it's really what does that brain require to ground oneself um, to sleep? So music. And I can tell you with both of my kids who neither of them slept through the night till they were 14, 15 months old, um, I would sing to them and I loved it. I mean, I don't miss, or I rather, I miss this part, um, although life, you know, it's great having them as teenagers as well. But I used to sing for them for 45 minutes, an hour, but I would sing, I wouldn't sing typical lullaby songs. I would sing like punk songs and sort of more of like a lullaby type of, um, you know, way. And with my son, actually the louder I sang, like I would pick songs that had like loud, like Bohemian Rhapsody, like those kinds of songs and he would go to sleep. My daughter was more the typical, like the kind of lower cadence. So it all depends on your own brain chemistry, but yes, music can be a very, very helpful sleep aid. Wonderful, thank you. A couple more for you. Um, one, you talked about um, children and music and their music choices. Um, question is, if your child, notice your child is starting to listen to some darker or angrier music, should a parent be concerned or is there a point at which that parent may want to seek help for their child or any, any red flags to look for, I think? It's a great question. So one is to, I always say to parents, don't, don't necessarily think that because your kid is listening to you know that kind of music that something must be wrong and at the same time don't assume that nothing is wrong it's like oh it's just the music they're listening to so it 
at, it's to really talk to them about it and um, ask them, you know, oh, you know, I notice you're listening to, you know, this, this music and, and, and I'm curious what it is about it that draws you to it. And let's say if um, the music tends to have themes of, of depression and alienation, maybe even sort of suicidal, like suicidality. And, and this is how, you know, I've worked with people where this has happened, where they said, because I, I feel this way. I feel like sometimes I don't want to be here. I feel, um, and then, and I would say, you know, to the parent, you know, rather than assuming that the music is making them feel that way, it's often the other way around, that them feeling that way is gravitating them to that. And that's where it would be uh, very important to get professional um, help. So if your, your kid can talk about this music that they're listening to and to validate and to say, wow, I can totally understand why if you're feeling that way, I'm glad that you can connect to something that resonates with that. And I want to make sure I'm giving you the the, uh, the right support. Um, and let's talk to somebody more about that so that your music can be one tool to help with that. But we want to give you other tools um, to do that. Um, and then I think a child often feels very validated, you know, in, in asking that. Sometimes I've had young patients, teenage patients who have actually said, I mean, sometimes they're aware of it at the time. And sometimes it's after the fact that they said, um, I sort of would blast this music that would kind of have some pretty dark themes, hoping that somebody would ask me about it, mm -hmm. hoping that someone would say, what is that? And sometimes, again, like, and, and I'm, I'm not blaming parents, but sometimes you go either to, oh, there's that crazy music, and we're not listening to the lyrics. Um, you know, when my, my daughter's definitely inherited my music addiction, healthy addiction. Um, my son likes music, but she's definitely my music lover and I listen I mean a lot of the artists she likes I happen to like as well and then there's some artists that I'm not as aware of and I find you know hear them and I read the lyrics and I'm like oh, okay this is because it's also helpful to kind of just know to me music is such a great lens too to kind of see where your child is at and and what they're listening to um, and there's no question I mean when I went from listening you know the go-go's and and pop music and everything and then I found the cure and Susie and the Banshees and all these this really dark you know music it it definitely was something I mean it, it came at a time in my early adolescence where uh, life seemed more complicated and and such so to have those dialogues and discussions and sometimes again parents hear it and think okay that's good and, and it might not warrant pro more professional help but those discussions can be when, when your child is telling you that they feel alienated, um, isolated, um, you know, if they're in their room and they don't have friends and all they're listening to is the music, it's not the music that's the issue. It's, oh, they, they're not connecting with anybody. And if music is your only friend, that can be problematic. And so that's where it could be better to get help. Thank you, very, very good advice. All righty, we have one last question here, which is, um, would you recommend the, excuse me, would you recommend the use of music to help facilitate bedtime or morning routines, particularly for kids who might be hard to get moving or settle down one way or the other? Oh, 100%, absolutely. I mean, music could be such a, um, because again, of the, the rhythm of it, that it almost to me, it, it, I mean, I almost can see music in my head. Like it's, if you think of the visual of it, you know, getting up in morning routines, like, oh, I have to get up and I have to brush my teeth and I take a shower and I eat breakfast. It can feel like this choppy sort of experience. And I know for me, I was not excited to go to school um, every day. And music would, almost can produce like this fluidity of, you know, putting on, you know, the music. And sometimes it also, it would help me actually with time management too, because I know a song is approximately three minutes or so with a lot of, you know, typical songs. So if I've listened to five songs, that's 15 minutes that just has gone by. That for me was a better sense of time management than I don't have, I, at that time in my life, I did not have an internal sense of time and time management, which is like an executive function. Um, I didn't look at clocks. I didn't like watches on my wrist. Um, so absolutely. I, my parents, I was again, so grateful. They bought me a shower radio, which it, I mean, this is in the eighties 
that could barely, you know, get the Kiss 108 in Boston. Um, but I would, would hang over the shower head and that would help me not because I love I could sit stand in the shower for a half an hour and just like space out when I was a kid and that music sort of helped that kind of flow the same with bedtime you know obviously it, depending on your kid it could be different kinds of music um cleaning up I remember when my kids were young and they'd play their toys and the room would be a mess it'd be like okay let's clean up and I'd have certain songs it's like okay let's clean up before the song ends and we clean up you know the toys put them you know in the toy box it could be a facilitator for, I mean, so many things, so many things. Wonderful. Well, this has been great. Really appreciate all of the information and new ideas um, we've got on the screen right now. We do have some information for folks um, who are on for some additional resources for um, Always Health Partners members. If you're on and you are not an Always Health Partners member and need help with any sort of a mental or behavioral health concern, typically your insurance company will have a number to call, check your ID card, and even our members can check the back of their ID card for telephone number to call as well. Um, thank you again, Dr. Olivardia. Um, I hope everybody will take a moment to complete a three question evaluation at the close of the session and do keep an eye on your uh, email box for a copy of today's recording and slides. Thank you again. I All hope right. everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Take care, everyone.